It's been a journey. It's been a long journey. To be exact, March 21st, 2019 was the day I got my 2008 Audi R8 with the twin turbo kit from Hefner on it. And it was the cheapest twin turbo Audi R8 in the country by a long shot. Just didn't run. On today's episode of Watch Jargo, we review my journey and the ridiculous amount of money I spent bringing my 2008 Audi R8 back to life. What is going on guys? I am Watch Jargo and today we are here victorious together. Like I said, March 21st, 2019 was the day this car showed up. And of course you guys remember that video and the next video where we started looking over it to see what was wrong with it. And the next video where Hoovy came over to the house and we went over uh, how he influences all of his friends with terrible car decisions. I still think this was a great decision. It's been 943 days since the day this car has been dropped off. 1,357,000, I'm kidding. We're not gonna go over the minutes but it's been a very long journey. And today, we're gonna take you back through it. So here are the pictures from my R8 when it got dropped off at my house. It was $55,000, and before it even got to my house, I had spent another 900 and change shipping it from Phoenix, Arizona to Wichita, Kansas. It got dropped off, it uh, wouldn't do anything, it was completely dead, the battery was toast in the car, so me and a group of friends pushed it up my driveway into the garage, which was the car's resting place for the next year. I would say at least a year. Right after that, we started tearing into it. I had to buy a battery. We went to Audi. We bought a brand new battery from Audi. That was like $300 and change. Put that in the car. Lo and behold, it started. And we backed it out of the garage. And boy, oh boy, was this car a smoke machine. I didn't know it yet, there was a hole in the piston. I just knew it was down a cylinder, but there was a hole in a piston and it was shoving all that oil from the oil squirters up underneath the pistons, up through the valve train, and it was just fogging that oil out. And it was honestly hilarious when the thing started up. I mean, it was just smoke as far as the eye could see. We drove it back into the garage and started tearing this thing down. Now, when I bought this car, I had a discussion with the previous owner and he had talked to a few shops and those shops had been confident they could rebuild this engine for like $5,000 total, pulling it out of the car and everything, which uh, turned out to not quite be the case once I got the engine uh, almost out. I called everybody I knew and nobody would touch an Audi V8 with four time, three or four timing chains, whichever one it is, on the front of the engine, on the firewall side of the engine, and it has to have custom pistons made and custom sleeves made for all eight cylinders to put something like that back together. So I ended up going to the Audi dealership, Walzer Audi of Wichita, and ordering a new engine. Now they helped me out quite a bit. They gave me a, a pretty solid discount. Retail on that engine is $25,000. They sold it to me for $20,000. So right there, I had $75,000 in this car plus another uh, thousand and sorry, 76 and change thousand dollars in this car. So we got to work on it again. Eric, Gabe, and Josh and I, just kept grinding on this one day at a time, making awesome progress updates and really showing you guys every step of the way of being one of the only people in the world to ever rebuild an aftermarket twin turbo kit exotic in the garage at your house. And it can be done, it can absolutely be done. I labeled every connection. We took so many pictures. I will just hit you guys with a, a ton of those pictures right now. You can see like, I mean, I have an entire Google Drive folder of pictures of the engine and from every single angle so we can see how every single thing went together because we did this with no service manuals and no books and no diagram for the aftermarket twin turbo system. We labeled it all, we took it all apart and anything that I couldn't figure out with common sense, I mean, we took care of to make sure it was exactly right when it went back together. A lot of the, I mean, there's like 400 hoses in this thing. It's, it's outrageous. It's hose spaghetti everywhere. Connectors were a little bit easier. Usually the wiring harness lays where it belongs in the engine and you can kind of just set it all down and it will go where it's supposed to go. The hoses were a different story. But we just kept on grinding. We found out it needed a cat. That was a thousand and change from Audi again, a brand new exhaust manifold. The cats are integrated in it. So that went back in the car. New V-band clamps went in it. So much new stuff went into this car. 
I, I don't even know at this point. I mean, we kind of lost track of how crazy it got as we got into the car. It has a new AC compressor, which I showed you guys that. We took a brand new Huracan Performante. What's funny, that blue Lamborghini Huracan Performante door that's beside me in the corner back there is the wrecked Huracan that compressor came off of. So I found out you could switch the hats on the compressors from a Huracan to an R8. Uh, you take a whole bunch of it apart, but you can swap it over and it works perfectly. And you have to do an AC compressor while the engine's out because changing the AC compressor on an R8 is engine out. That is no joke. So I'm super happy that my friends at Prime Cuts Chop Shop sent me that AC compressor and we got that done before I put the engine back in, which was a huge, huge deal. Oh, also the drive shaft for the AC compressor. It's direct drive off of a chain. Uh, you have to swap that over as well. On the V10, it's much longer as you would expect. The V10 engine, it's a little bit longer. Anyway, tons and tons and tons of work still went into getting this car back together. We got the new engine in, started it up, and there was a problem. It didn't really run very well. It, it kind of ran terribly. It would start and it would drive, but it was struggling so much. And, the car was trying to put throttle in and it couldn't put enough throttle in it. There was something wrong with it. So I drove it on a trailer with the bumper still off and we headed down to Hefner Performance in Florida. I left the car with them. I said, here's where I'm at. Something's going on. I've got a low fuel pressure code. And for some reason, uh, I don't know what's going on with it. I mean, I've got plenty of fuel pressure. I know the electric pump's working fine. There's just, for some reason, the engine's throwing a low fuel pressure code. Somewhere along the road while it was going back together, the DI pumps got moved over to the new engine. And we didn't actually look at them, like we'd, nobody double checked them. And what had happened are there's two uh, lifters that ride on the cam and those lifters go up and down and they actuate those high pressure fuel pumps, they got left out. So the engine was actually running on like 60 PSI of fuel pressure instead of the 800 uh, that you would expect from a DI pump. Crazy that the car ran at all but it was doing fine and it never had any RPM in it. I mean, it was literally only idled onto the trailer. It moved onto the trailer and off of the trailer into Hefner's shop and that was it. They found that, I overnighted them the parts, they put them in, they're like, hey, it runs fine. So we did everything pretty well. And then they had the car for about four more months while they pulled the intake manifold, inspected some things, uh, checked the turbos, rerouted the vacuum lines and replaced every AN line in the system. The, uh, all the oil returns, the coolant into the turbos and the wastegates, they went through all those AN lines. They're all new and they're super nice lines. I mean, AN lines with aircraft sheathing over them, all that good stuff, it's all hanging out in the back of this car and it's really nice. All because there was one, there was a drip from a coolant line and I didn't want to keep over tightening the AN line. I was like, let's, let's just replace that. So that was $4,161 at Hefner. Uh, they did me a solid. They took basically all of their labor back out of the job and charged me for a few parts, like the AN lines. It was almost, a, it, was, it was more than $1,000 just in AN lines and uh, a little bit of time to diagnose some things and look over the car and uh, look at the intercooler pump, a few things like that. And then I got the car back. So I drove it back from Florida. There was 40 degrees of timing in this thing when you get into the throttle. 40 degrees of timing plus boost is a very, very, very bad day. I mean, it's the end of an engine like that. Jason was like, don't drive it home. You shouldn't do that. I did it. I drove it home and I probably took a minute to a minute and a half to get to 60 mile an hour every single time I had to accelerate. It was all highways. I would keep the throttle at 10 to 15%, never touch the boost, babied this thing home as well as I could. I didn't want to pull it back with the trailer again because that was crazy the first time. And it was a nice drive home, honestly. I'd get up to speed, I could set the cruise, mostly flat highways, and it was a good drive home. Now, one of the reasons the R8 went to Hefner in the first place was to get tuned. I thought he'd have the old file, he could flash the car, we'd be back on the road, no problem at all. But when I got there, we had a lot of conversations. He said that it was his kit, of course, but he used to sell the kit to shops and other shops could install it themselves and flash it. Well, what happened to this car was a disaster, like a hurricane had hit this car. He said the suspension light was on, the suspension computer had corruption in it, the ECU he didn't have the files for, uh, he did a little bit of logging and said, this is where I'm leaving it. I can't tune the car because I don't have the files. See if you can find somebody to do it. And 
let's go from there. And if he did tune the car, he'd have to uh, buy a license for this car on some new software and tune it from scratch. And he guessed that that would be about $10,000 in work. Basically redeveloping a platform that nobody should be developing for. This thing is a dinosaur. You should not be putting money in one if you have it. Just fix it and drive it. Don't do anything else. Don't, don't twin turbo this car. It's an adventure that I can go through because I can afford to be without the car for two years. Uh, you probably don't want to go through this if you're buying one. Leave it stock or buy one that's already together and running. Those are your options. So I called everybody. As you guys know, I'm good friends with Underground Racing. John Reed, they're some of the best tuners in the nation, building the best of the best of these. Underground told me not to buy this the first day. I, I, honestly, I wired the money for this the day before TX2K 19, and then I was sitting there talking to KC the next day, and he's like, you shouldn't have bought that. <laughs> I was like, mm, yep, you're right. But that's neither here nor there. I called everyone in the nation. I called APR. APR said, those files are gone. We can't help you. I called AMS. Martin said, sorry, man, it's not what we do. I called T1 and they said, sorry, man, it's not on a Motec. Actually, they said that we'll help you. And then I said, it's not on a Motec. And they said, never mind. And I called, uh, I mean, I called everybody. I called everybody that tunes Audis. They all said no, the whole nation. And before you're asking, uh, you're going to suggest things like, 316 and Sheepy and everyone else that's on Motec and underground tunes on Motec. Motec is how it's done. Motec builds a kit for the V10s. They do not build a kit for this. Nobody puts it on this because you'd have to wire it from scratch. That would be ridiculous and it makes no sense. Cyvex makes an ECU for this. Nobody wants to tune Cyvex and I don't want to have a Cyvex. I don't even want to own one. Motec is the way. You can't put a Motec on this car. That's where we ended up. And that's where we get to boosted Euro. So, Mirza, who you guys saw in the video yesterday, flew in this week after we worked on this car forever. We tried to flash it remotely, brick the ECUs, it happens. Honestly, my battery power probably wasn't stable enough and we're not tuning with the correct box. We're using the Autels interface, uh, which works, but isn't optimal. One ECU got corrupted and the car would never start at all. It would just turn the key on and the cooling fan comes on and it means there's an error with the ECUs when the cooling fan comes on. I don't know exactly why it does it, but it's like an emergency mode for the car. It just turns on the fan. And that's all it would do. So we cut the ECUs out. You guys remember that? Gabe and I sitting in the back with a Dremel tool slotting those security screws on the ECUs. We finally got them out. Uh, what do they call that? The chastity belt on the ECUs. It's supposed to keep you from ever removing them. I got them out. I overnighted them to boosted Euro. Mirza pulled them apart, bench tuned them, flashed the calibration onto the thing, said, here you go, uh, overnighted them back to me. And he said, drive around, no more than 30% throttle, see how the car does, we'll get some logs and we'll get it tuned. So we put the ECUs in. That's the video where we did the old N64 trick, blowing them off. I thought maybe it was just a connection, like the connector to the ECU, something like that was our problem. That's not what it was. It was a checksum error on one of the ECUs and after it would start the first time, the ECUs would disagree with each other, lock the car out, and it would go back into its cooling fan emergency state, and the car would not start again. If you ever cycled the ignition, you were out of luck until you did a battery pull and waited for them to reset, hooked it back up, and you could drive the car or start the car one more time. A few months later, everything came together. Mirza flew in uh, yesterday, of course. He tuned the car. The first flash out of the box, it was running again properly. Then he got the calibration on it. And that brings us to today. Good morning, ladies. Oh wait, wrong, wrong thing. Anyway, we're here with my Audi R8, putting gas in it because we need some fresh fuel before we go tune this thing. So uh, let me throw some fuel in this real quick and drive over to the shop. As we're gonna show you something pretty cool. First, the R8 had to come all the way back apart because there's a boost leak on the passenger side. So we're trying to get that resolved as fast as possible, but we've got the car up on the quick jacks and this tool that sits up in the front, uh, in the under the hood area in the bonnet is literally, if I can make it do it, what pulls those plastic caps out. I always thought you just used a needle nose or something, but it turns out Audi gives you a tool for this. Then you just need a 17 in the wheel lock tool. Well, here's our Lowe's built vacuum or boost leak checker. We've got a three inch coupler going on the turbo, three inch cap on that turbo. 
and we can air this up with a tire valve stem. So I just drilled a hole in that cleanout cap, put a tire valve stem in it. We've got it hooked up to the uh, inflator here. And now we can put air in the system and listen. There's a leak. Checking for uh, boost leaks here. There's an open nipple right here. And for some reason, it looks like it goes to nothing. It comes out of a check valve and then goes to a nipple. I don't see any hoses that fell off anywhere. I don't see anything missing. If I remember right, all the routing here is right. I don't know if there's ever went anywhere, man. All right, we found our culprit. This T, this side here was unplugged. It was just open to the atmosphere. And that is probably why the intake valves were never actually actuating on this thing. It has, uh, you know, variable runners and they open to change the velocity in the intake. Well, the throttle response was bad. We didn't have any boost. We had a lot of little problems. It was probably all this T. VRA is back together, hopefully with less boost leaks now. We're gonna head back out and try it again in just a few minutes. All the clamps are tightened again. Everything's put back together. And Mirza is flashing it again. Yep. With, uh, is this the uh, secret sauce one? Well, in the first log that we did, there was some timing pulls. So what we did is, because uh, he's running 91. Yep. So we took some ignition out. I uh, richened it up and we'll see what it does now. You said you pulled out like four degrees? Four uh, degrees like what? two or three degrees to see. Okay. I don't want to do a drastic change. Sure. Because, you know, might be too much and these take forever to flash. So. They do. It's honestly, it takes what, like 35 minutes? 30. Yeah, so both ECU takes about 15 minutes each, so 30 minutes. It's been flashed a lot, but it's getting there. I'm so excited, man. Yep. So excited. We're gonna take it back out. I have a feeling it's gonna be a different car without that leak, so. So testing the new features. <laughs> yeah! All right, so what do you have to do to put in the two-step? Um, clutch down. Yep. Well, car's gotta be fully up to temp. Okay. And just throttle all the way down. <laughs> uh, and then out of... In gear, it'll work, I assume. It doesn't matter if you're okay. in gear or not, but okay. that's typically for launching, so you'll be like first. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. in the stage, and then that's it. Awesome. Oh, I guess I can almost do it rolling. It's like a rolling anti-lag, but... Uh, no, this is strictly launch control for launching. Oh, okay, okay. So when you're at the quarter mile and you want to, yeah. You know. Gotcha. Sweet. Go. You're good. Ready? Third Go. gear? Yep. Limit at 6700. Hit it. Hard time. today wasn't without issue we ended up listening to the engine a little bit while we were driving and hearing like a weird deal where it sounded like one diverter valve would hit before the other which makes no sense because they're teed and only like this far apart it wasn't the diverter valves but there was a boost leak and we had had an issue with the intake flaps opening and closing like they were supposed to it was throwing a code so we deleted the codes but then we decided to look into it a little bit more in case they hadn't been bypassed or locked open we found out they hadn't been. We ended up finding out that one of the check valves in the vacuum system that controls the intake flaps was flipped upside down and causing them to never open like they're supposed to. So we got that fixed. And also one of the position sensors is reading a little bit iffy. So I'm gonna have to swap that out. But that's, those are the last things. That's what I was in the engine bay doing. We got that sorted out. We went to Lowe's, we built a big boost testing kit, pulled the intakes back off the turbos, put a bunch of pressure on it to find that leak. Uh, we did a lot of work sorting all of that out and checking the rest of the system. We put all that back together and we headed out again. That's where we made those pulls. The car was awesome. It runs great. I'm super happy, but it still seemed like we were down on power a little bit. Uh, we think it's because it created another boost leak. So we had to go through, loosen all the clamps, tighten it all back up again, because really none of it was tight. 
and it's it's tight now now it's very tight uh we used the cordless ratchet to tighten out all the t-bolt clamps and now i think it's finally good so i need to go home and get the engine covers you can see that it's all wide open we got to put the engine covers back on and uh that should pretty much wrap this thing up i'm very excited for that detail dudes are washing it tomorrow because it's honestly pretty dirty even though it might look clean uh, they've got a little bit of work to do on that. I'm pumped about it. So as of today, 943 days later, I can drive my twin turbo R8. And it's great. It's honestly super chill to drive and you get into the power and it's got some power. So it's fun. So there you go. I have $90,000 in this V8 R8. Luckily it's worth it because it's a gated manual. If this was not a gated manual, there's no chance on the planet it would be worth it, but it's the one people want. It's a real twin turbo kit, not something hacked together. It's a Hefner kit. So it's a known entity. It's been checked out by him. We've got a car, all Motul fluids. Huge thank you to everybody that's helped me with this. Huge thank you to you guys for watching the saga. Uh, one of the biggest builds on the channel. One, it's something that basically no one's really ever done. Uh, Tavares, of course, has done his, um, that's it, right? I, I don't know really anyone else that rebuilds these twin turbo setups in their garage at home. And it's been a wild journey and uh, I think it was pretty fun. Huge thank you to Mirza for flying in, spending his time and making this thing work today. Really make, it's got options that basically no other V8s have. Uh, launch control, um, pop some bangs. I mean, it's got all kinds of cool new toys on it now. It's all in the tune, stuff that he's had built out, and I'm, I'm in love with that. So, it's kind of for sale. Email me if you're actually interested. The price is clearly like in the 90,000 plus ballpark there. And if nobody wants it, I'll probably list it pretty soon. But I am gonna go drive it around some more and enjoy the car a little bit, do the brake and oil change. It's time to actually get that done. Uh, more mo tool for this thing. I mean, everything in it's new. So to wrap this up, I guess I'm not avoiding my problems anymore. Maybe the next one should say it's, it's done or conquer your fears head on, one of the two, or it doesn't really matter what it is, you can fix it in your garage at home. Just take your time, do it right. And that's all there is to it. Keep track of all the parts, label everything if you don't know what you're doing. And uh, if you're into service manuals, you can get those too. I just, I don't love service manuals. So that is it for today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to head on over to shopwatchjr.com where you can get cool shirts just like this. And please like, share, subscribe, do whatever you want to do. And I will talk to you next time. I don't want to hear anything about me using my quick jacks when I have lifts right there. It is insane to get this thing on a lift. A lowered RA is not something you're putting on a two post. Even the quick jacks are actually too high to fit underneath this car. You have to have somebody very carefully because you don't want to tear them up, lift up, the fenders and then push the quick jacks in. We've always had to do that since day one with this car. Quick jacks are about the only thing that lift an R8 unless you have a full in-ground drive on lift. So uh, a two post, even that Corvette, which is not that low, has to be driven up on blocks before it can go on a two post. Now that one twin turbo Audi's fixed, let's get back to the next one, a car I am truly in love with. I hope you're all on board for this because it was cheap. It's from Car Track. It's incredible to drive. I can set lap records at it and it just, the thing is I don't care if it breaks. It's really, really nice to have a car that performs well and is incredible on track. And if it breaks, you can afford to fix it, you know, very easily. What's an engine for this going to cost? 800 bucks. What's an engine for this going to cost? <laughs> we already know the answer to that. Well, if you saw the VinWiki episode, I got my turbos. 